I know it's been a long time since I've posted anything. And to be totally honest with you, I wasn't 100% sure whether to continue the channel or not. But here I am again. And if you do enjoy the content of this or any of my stories, please subscribe and like. The following is an audio presentation of The Shadow Remnant, read to you by its author, James Griffin. This, as well as many other titles by me, are available either in other YouTube presentations on my channel or in paper or ebook versions from Amazon.com. I hope that you enjoy today's story. Though the events in this story are based on well documented theories created by historical people, such as Albert Einstein and Nathan Rosen, and it references legitimate tragedies and events, such as Apollo 1, the Space Shuttle's Challenger in Columbia, and the WOW signal, the story itself is a work of fiction. All other names, characters, places, events, and incidents in this story are either the product of the author's imagination or used in a fictitious manner. Any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, or actual events is purely coincidental. Introduction It is said that curiosity killed the cat. But what about when the death toll was far greater? It is, after all, curiosity that has led humanity not only to many of its greatest achievements, but also to many of its most tragic events. In the ancient world, there were so many ships that went missing that people believed the Earth was flat, and that these missing ships had simply traveled too far and dropped off the edge of the Earth. Countless explorers have ventured into the jungles of the world, never to be seen again. Numerous mountain climbers have lost their lives trying to scale to the pinnacles of the Earth and far too many underwater divers longing to see the ocean depths have themselves gone missing, never to be seen again. Even NASA has suffered numerous tragedies in their attempt to explore off-world. There was the asphyxiation of the crew of the Apollo 1 spacecraft in 1967, and the losses of the space shuttle's Challenger in 1986 and Columbia in 2003, just to name a few. Yet despite the risk, there are still many that have a desire to discover the unknown, sometimes just in pursuit of knowledge, while other times trying to find something a little more tangible. Chapter 1. The Mission David Hilker, commander of the newly commissioned deep space shuttle, the Rosin Bridge, sits alone in his den reviewing crew profile reports and ship specifications in preparation for his upcoming mission as his wife, Catherine, walks into the room. I just knew you would turn this mission down, David. If not for me, then at least for her, she says, motioning toward a picture of their young daughter, Julie. Catherine, David says sympathetically, you and Julie are why I'm going. You know the shape this world is in. Pandemics, chemical warfare, weapons of mass destruction, global terrorism... There's no way that this world is going to survive much longer. We have to have a plan B, Catherine. She has to have a plan B, David says, motioning toward the same picture of their daughter that Catherine had motioned toward just a moment before. And if I can give her that plan B, a means of escape, then I will. I understand why you're doing it, David. I just wish it wasn't you. I know, David says, rising from his chair, walking to his wife, who is now softly crying, taking her into his arms. What makes you think you'll even find answers where you're going, Catherine asks, in an attempt to compose herself. In 1977, there was a radio telescope from Ohio State University that detected a narrowband radio signal from this same area. And for just a moment in time, it's believed that observers heard from a planet other than our own. If that other planet is there, then I'll find it, and hopefully it will be hospitable to those like us in the event that we ever need a new home. But this method of travel, I mean wormholes, Catherine says, looking confused, traveling through man-made black and white holes in space. It's as if my husband's life hinges on a bad sci-fi movie plot, Catherine says in a rather frustrated tone. No, Angel, David says calmly. This method of travel was theoretical when it was first speculated by Albert Einstein and Nathan Rosen, but today it's a scientific fact. I've seen the mathematical equations and computer simulations. It works, Catherine, and I'm confident that this scientific breakthrough in travel is going to be exactly what finds humanity a means of escape and a fresh start on another planet. I hope you're right, David. 
I hope you're right. Chapter 2, Pre-Launch Activities The next morning, Commander Hilker kisses his wife Catherine and his daughter Julie, then reluctantly leaves to report to base. He knows that his family will be at the Kennedy Space Center tomorrow to see him off, but that doesn't make saying goodbye any easier. As he arrives at the base, there are still remnants of tears in his eyes, for no matter how confident he acts around others, he still knows the dangers that he and his crew face, and he knows that he may have just left his home for the last time. David checks in at the main gate, and then immediately reports to Hangar G, a heavily secured building containing the Rosin Bridge Space Shuttle. The Rosin, as it's being called for short, looks much the same as shuttles from the past, only this one is slightly larger. The external fuel tank alone is the size of a 25-story building, nearly 375 feet tall and over 40 feet wide. This is also the first time that a space shuttle has ever been equipped with a type of torpedo tube, not for warfare, but instead to launch the Gamma Pulse missile that will initiate the black hole that will hopefully take the Rosin Bridge shuttle to its destination in the Sagittarius constellation. The shuttle will be equipped with eight crew members, the primaries being pilots and mission specialists, all with gold astronaut pin status, meaning that they have all been to space before. There is, of course, command pilot David Hilker, astronaut pilot Jason Fry. Then there are also two mission specialists, Eric Daniel and Nikki Jenkins. Then there are four payload specialists, which are essentially civilian scientists, an engineer, and a government weapons consultant. Dr. Andrea Savoy is an astrophysicist, while Dr. Navin Patel is a theoretical physicist. Alex Gray is an engineer, and Jaleel Anders is a consultant from the company that created the onboard torpedo tube. Good morning, Commander, Flight Director Adam Fleming says as he approaches Commander Hilker. Flight Director Fleming oversees the overall mission and payload operations from a mission control point of view. He is essentially Commander Hilker's counterpart from an operational or earthbound perspective. Good morning, Alex, David responds. So it looks like everything is set. Do we still have a go for launch tomorrow, David asks. We're as ready as we'll ever be, Commander. The ship looks great. The crew has arrived. The weather is supposed to be clear. And all sectors of mission control assure me that we have a green light. Good. Good, David says, nodding in response. Well, I'm going to go and check on my crew. Please let me know if you need anything. Will do, Commander. This is going to be a day of checks and rechecks, ensuring that nothing goes wrong. Luckily, the crew interviews and press releases have come to a close, as now it's the politician's turn to do all the talking. David knows that he can't allow himself to be distracted by fear or even sadness at missing his family. So as he walks into the medical area, he's no longer David Hilker father and husband. Today he is Commander Hilker, command pilot of the Rosin Bridge Space Shuttle. So as he walks into the medical area where his crew waits in lines for final medical screenings, he walks in with the focus of a commanding officer, his eyes refusing to divert one way or another, walking directly to Dr. Shannon Riker, chief medical officer of the mission. He picks up a clipboard that had been laying on a desk just to Dr. Riker's right and asks, Are there any problems? Never looking up from the report that he's reading. No, sir. Everything and everyone appears in order. I'm giving them some final vaccinations and vitamin shots, trying to keep them as strong and as healthy as I can, Dr. Riker responds. Good. And what about you, doctor? Commander Hilker asks, glancing up from the report that he's reading. It's my understanding that you are coming on board as a payload specialist to serve as our medical officer. Is that correct? Yes, it is, Dr. Riker responds. I hope that's not a problem. No, not at all. I'm just not used to having a medical officer accompany me on a mission. Well, this isn't exactly your standard mission, the doctor says with a smile. (laughs) No, that it's not, Commander Hilker responds with a slight laugh. I'm proud to have you. Please ensure that you go through final medical screening and receive all of the standard care that you are providing to the rest of the crew. Will do, Commander. As Commander Hilker walks toward the exit, he greets other members of the crew with a wave and a smile, continuing on his morning rounds. Next, Commander Hilker enters the shuttle, and he takes a seat in the command chair. He has already experienced spaceflight, so he just sits there visualizing the launch. 
imagining him and Jason seated in the front of the shuttle as the remaining crew members are strapped in the back. The vibration of the launch shaking their bodies as an angry man might shake his fist, only worse. Yes, Commander Hilker has been here before, so he sits there, trying to anticipate any issues that he or his crew may encounter. Excuse me, Commander, a voice interrupts. The well-groomed young man wearing yellow coveralls who is speaking looks fresh out of college. He's a member of the ground crew, running last-minute system checks on the shuttle. Reaching his hand out toward Commander Hilker, the young man says, I just want to tell you how much I admire what you and your crew are doing, sir. I mean, you're probably the first people I've ever met that are actually trying to save the world. Commander Hilker, now alert and back in the present, extends his hand, shaking the young man's hand. Never underestimate the part that you play in this launch, son, because we're all in this together. Thank you, the young man says, smiling. Then he returns and goes back to his duties. Commander Hilker hates when he's called a hero, because to him he's just doing his job. Sure, it's a dangerous job, but in his mind, he's no more a hero than the cop on the street, the fireman responding to an alarm, or the soldier in battle, because they're all putting their lives on the line, just as he does. Yet there are so few that recognize their sacrifice, or the sacrifice made by their families. Once all the system checks are complete, Commander Hilker makes a stop at Mission Control to meet others that will be working behind the scenes. Then he enjoys a light dinner with his crew. Commander Hilker finally goes to his room and has a video chat with his wife and daughter. They talk for a long time, but honestly they say very little, simply proclaiming the love that they have for one another, him assuring them that he's going to be all right and telling them that he needs them to be strong for him. Finally, reluctantly, they end their call, and Commander Hilker closes his eyes, perhaps for the last time on planet Earth. Chapter 3. The Mission Begins It's a somber atmosphere as the crew of the Rosin board their new ship. The day of their launch has finally arrived, and even though the primary crew has been to space before, they're still cognizant of the dangers that they face. Command pilot David Hilker and astronaut pilot Jason Fry board the shuttle taking their seats, which are now at a 90-degree angle, as astronaut support personnel begin strapping them in. Once the pilots are in position, the additional crew members take their seats and are similarly strapped in. Each of them sits silently, seemingly lost in thought, their minds racing not only on the normal dangers of space travel, but also on the unknown aspects of this particular mission their hearts beating so rapidly that the internal vibration can almost be confused with the actual shuttle launch itself. Commander Hilker, though confident in their mission, can't help but wonder about their ability to not only create, but also successfully navigate through black and white holes. I mean, is the theory of folding space to streamline travel obtainable? Or is his wife Catherine correct in saying this is all just a bad sci-fi film? Jason, on the other hand, is far too busy worrying about the here and now to be overly concerned with what awaits them. He's in constant communication with Mission Control, as all systems are verified and the determination on launch ability is confirmed. Finally, after what seems like forever, they are given the green light, and they know that their launch is quickly approaching. As soon as the green light is given, all crew are in continual communication with one another. The launch of a space vessel is a very dangerous thing, and all personnel have to be fully aware of all things that can go wrong. There are 500 flips and switches within the shuttle cockpit, and everyone on board has to know what each of them does and when to use them as their very lives depend on this information. As the countdown begins, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, each crew member braces themselves, knowing that in just a little over eight minutes, their shuttle is going to move from a standing position to a launch speed of approximately 20,000 miles per hour. This is why the shuttle is equipped with engines that produce over 37 million horsepower of thrust. Five, four, three, two, one, mission control continues. Once the launch is initiated and the engines hit their maximum output, the crew is pinned back in their seats, 
shaking with more air turbulence than even the most seasoned commercial pilot can imagine. At this point, the shuttle is burning over 12 tons of fuel per second, and the crew is shaking to the point that even the most professional of them can no longer focus on their instrumentation. Command pilot Hilker does all that he can to fly the shuttle, while astronaut pilot Jason Fry controls the thrusters. In less than 10 minutes, the rosin breaks free of the gravitational pull of the Earth, stabilizing itself as it continues to its projected target distance of 800 miles in space, which is more than twice the distance that any other shuttle has ever traveled before. Continuing on their trajectory, the rosin and its crew arrive within the hour, and they set out to accomplish the more unfamiliar aspects of their mission. Control, this is the rosin, astronaut pilot Fry says to Mission Control in his well-articulated British accent. We're in position, and our payload specialists are preparing for the missile launch. Roger that, rosin, Mission Control responds. Commander Hilker removes his straps and steps back to speak with payload specialists Jaleel Anders and Dr. Navin Patel. So be honest, Navin, Commander Hilker says to the ship's theoretical physicist, overseeing the more experimental aspects of the Gamma Pulse missile. Do you think this thing's going to work? If I didn't, Commander, I wouldn't be here, Dr. Patel says with a smile. Hilker returns Navin's smile and then continues. So how about you, Jaleel? Hilker says to the ship's weapon specialist. How much longer until we're going to be ready to launch? Payload specialist Anders never looks up from her work, checking launch systems, onboard computers, etc., and then flatly responds, We're almost there, sir. I just need to confirm a few more things. Then, as she finishes her breath, she says, We're ready, Commander. Wow, that was quick, David says with a slight chortle. He then keys a communication switch near where he is standing. Mission Command, this is the Rosin, Commander Hilker announces. Operation Black Hole is ready to commence. Roger that, Rosin, Flight Director Adam Fleming responds from his communications panel back on Earth. You can fire the missile when ready. Roger that, Control. Setting launch timer at five seconds. Commander Hilker says flipping another switch as he begins reading off the descending number display. Four. Three. Jaleel Anders takes the firing trigger in hand. Two. One. Launch, Hilker says calmly, pointing at Anders. She pulls the trigger slowly and steadily as the crew hears the sound of the launch tube opening, the system propelling the Gamma Pulse missile from its berth to detonate in an empty segment of space. The crew sits wide-eyed, watching, waiting for an explosion, when suddenly the missile just disappears. Wait, what just happened? Dr. Riker says, confused. Why was there no explosion? Did the missile malfunction? Mission Specialist Nikki Jenkins asks. No, it worked perfectly, Dr. Andrea Savoy, the mission's astrophysicist, responds calmly. Consider the nature of a black hole. Even if it is newly created, and it is minuscule as a slit, it is still going to serve as a type of vacuum so powerful that it's not going to allow light to escape from it. As soon as that missile exploded, the slit was opened and even the flash from the explosion was removed from our sight. That brings up a good point, says Mission Specialist Eric Daniel. I mean, if light can't escape the gravitational pull of a black hole, then how are we going to? We're not going to be coming out of a black hole, Dr. Savoy says, not only to Eric, but also to the entire crew. We are instead going to be coming out of a white hole. Matter can enter and never escape from a black hole, but a white hole is simply the other side of that same hole. So just as nothing can escape a black hole, nothing can enter a white hole. The black hole is the entrance, and the white hole is the exit. It's as if we're crossing a one-way bridge. Then, when it's time to return to Earth, we launch the second missile and create a route back. So what's going to keep us safe on this one-way bridge? Alex Gray asks. I mean, it's not like we're on one of those television shows where we can simply turn on our force fields. That's where the dark matter comes in, interrupts Dr. Patel. Imagine dark matter is the voids that exist within outer space. Though there's nothing visible within those voids, the gravitational force they put out does still exist, 
and it impacts those things around them, often pushing or pulling away from one another, similar to magnetic repulsion. Dark matter ensures that the emptiness of space remains just that, emptiness. In the same way, the dark matter that was included in our missile will push against other aspects of matter, thereby keeping the black hole open and keeping our ship safe while we're inside of it. There it is, Dr. Savoy announces to the entire ship. There what is, Alex asks. The rotation of the black hole we just created, as it begins to take in aspects of its surroundings, it's beginning to grow. Commander Hilker clicks on the communication switch again. Mission Control, this is the rosin. Phase 1 of the Black Hole Creation Project is a success. According to estimations, the primordial black hole will not take long to develop, so we're going to begin securing the shuttle for entry. Roger that, Rosin, an unknown member of the Mission Control responds. It's time to save the world, a second, much more recognizable Adam Fleming interjects from Mission Control. Each of the crew of the Rosin shouts, one small step, and begins to smile and laugh as they begin the strap-in process. What begins is a minuscule slit slowly expands until it's large enough to take the rosin and its crew on a journey that they will never forget. Chapter 4, The Journey As the rosin takes a position just beyond the newly formed black hole, Jason Fry, the astronaut pilot of the mission, calls out to Commander Hilker, Sir, the gravitational pull is already intense. We're not going to be able to maintain this fringe position much longer. Roger that, Jason. Go ahead and proceed in. Will do, Jason calls back as he gently taps the rosin's thrusters, moving the shuttle forward slowly. The nose of the ship enters the event horizon, and the ship is instantly jerked forward. Jason instinctively starts to reverse thrusters. Dr. Savoy calls out, No, don't! Nearly panic-stricken. If we resist the gravitational pull of the black hole, it will rip our ship apart. With that said, Jason taps the thrusters forward again, doing the best that he can to match the gravitational pull in the nose of the ship. Slowly, the rosin enters the black hole, but navigating in such an atmosphere is far from easy. The gravitational pull on the rosin is constantly forward, but that's the only constant that Jason is experiencing. The strength of the pull, though intense, fluctuates, and if not for Jason's expert skills, the side push-pull would have caused the shuttle to spin out. The crew then notes the appearance of a type of atmospheric wave that can be seen but not felt. It's almost like an electric fog. I've got to increase speed, Jason calls out. We're starting to be stretched. Even before Jason says it, the remainder of the crew has already noticed it. Not just on the ship, but on their physical bodies as well. Mission Specialist Eric Daniel, who is seated just behind Commander Hilker, is enveloped in this atmospheric waves. He lifts and looks at his arm, noticing that his body is losing its physical density. No, Eric cries out as his body begins to dissipate. His fellow crew members watching as he transforms from solid matter to a gaseous element. Mission Specialist Nikki Jenkins, tears in her eyes, reaches out to her terrified friend, sobbing. She knows that there's nothing that she can do, for this is beyond their education and training. So as she sits there, helpless, she watches as Eric vanishes. Then that same atmospheric fog begins to surround payload specialist Alex Gray, the ship's engineer, and it appears he is going to undergo the same type of transformation. Commander Hilker cries out, There's the exit! Hit it! Jason slams the thrusters down as Alex continues to watch as the waves cover his body, his voice crying out, Please, God, please, no! The rosin jettisons from the white hole, the polar opposite of the black hole that they entered, thereby completing this leg of the journey. As soon as the shuttle is stable, Nikki unbuckles herself and collapses to her knees, her head buried in Eric's seat, his buckle still in place, but his body nowhere to be found. Dr. Patel and Dr. Savoy join her, doing the best they can to comfort her. Dr. Riker looks over Alex, who now appears in his normal state, checking his vital signs, and finally he administers a mild tranquilizer to allow Alex to relax. Jason remains seated, his every muscle is crying in agony, navigating through a black hole as far from an average day at the gym. 
Dr. Riker checks on our hero pilot as Commander Hilker continues checking readouts on his instrument panel. Dr. Savoy, Commander Hilker calls out, Please look at this. Something just isn't right. Dr. Savoy comes to Commander Hilker's side, looking at the same instrument panels that David is looking at. She punches a series of buttons into the keyboard with a look of fear on her face. What is it? Nikki asks concernedly. According to these charts, we came out very near where we went in, Dr. Savoy says in a very confused voice. We aren't anywhere near the Sagittarius constellation. Then where are we? Nikki asks, nearly sobbing. We're in the Milky Way galaxy, within a few hundred miles from Earth. So we accomplished nothing other than getting Eric killed, Nikki responds angrily. No, it's worse than that, Commander Hilker says. Being this close to Earth, our communication system should be bombarded with radio and television waves. But everything's silent. What do you mean, everything's silent, Dr. Patel says, breaking into the conversation. Just that. I hear nothing. It's as if I were pressing a stethoscope against a rock. There's just silence. Commander Hilker flips his communication switch and calls out, Mission Control, this is the rosin. Mission Control, this is rosin. The only response that Hilker receives is empty static. Dr. Fleming, this is Commander Hilker. Please respond, Hilker says in desperation. Can anyone read me? This is Commander David Hilker of the USS Rosin Bridge. If anyone hears me, please respond. Still, there's nothing. Okay, everyone, please return to your seats and strap in as we're preparing for re-entry. Jason, continue to projected landing site one at Kennedy Space Center. If we encounter any issues, divert to Edwards Air Force Base. Will do, Commander, Jason responds. As the crew takes their seat, Pilot Fry begins the re-entry process, and Commander Hilker continuously tries to reach someone, anyone, via their communications system. The rosin is enveloped in flames as the friction of the Earth's atmosphere meets the velocity of the ship's descent. Fry struggles to maintain control. His only goal to get to his assigned runway, ready to be home again, putting this mission behind him. As they leave the plasma burn of re-entry, Fry and Hilker begin noticing their surroundings. They see the dilapidated structures that just a few days ago represented the pride of worldly architecture. They notice that the upper levels of buildings appear to have been ripped from their foundations, as if some giant hand had reached down, plucking them as a person would pick grapes from a vineyard. No cars are moving anywhere. No signs of life. Nikki, Commander Hilker calls out to his mission control specialist. Please run an analysis. See if you can find signs of life anywhere. Nikki taps on the Rosin's computers, accessing different levels of diagnostic equipment, studying not only internal but also external systems. Commander, Nikki says in a confused tone, according to sensors, life is everywhere below us. Okay, where at? Commander Hilker asks. They appear to be confined in the more shadowy aspects of the world, as if they're hiding from the light of the sun. I'm trying to get a complete analysis on their physical design, as readings are coming back rather inconclusive. But I can only assume they're human. I mean, we just left here. So there's no way that another species could have moved in this quickly. Wait, Dr. Savoy jumps in. Maybe the reason that we didn't travel through space was because we instead traveled through time. I mean, in training for this mission, we studied the twin paradox, where we learned that movement in space at high speeds can greatly slow the passing of time. Maybe to us, we've only been gone a few days, but to the world, we may have been gone for centuries. We can figure this out when we get to solid ground, Jason calls out. Brace yourselves, because we're preparing to land. Jason never looks away from the runway that they are fast approaching. Suddenly the landing gear lowers as they watch the remnants of a great Air Force base fly past them from their shuttle windows. The sensation of touching down, of being home, causes all of them to rejoice. But then they are forced to reflect on the home that they have just returned to. I need a complete environmental analysis before we leave this ship, Commander Hilker announces to everyone within hearing range. For all we know, this could be a post-apocalyptic world covered in nuclear fallout. We need to know if it's safe before we go out in it. 
Nikki never leaves the ship's computers, continuing to click on her keyboard, trying to find answers for everyone's questions. It is then that it happens. The Rosin's onboard computers make contact with an old underground Air Force system that is still on. As Dr. Savoy had speculated, though the journey had been only a few days to the crew of the Rosin, to the world they had been gone for nearly 131 years. Not that it mattered as the destruction that the crew of the Rosin was seeing was complete within 10 years from their mission onset date. Records indicate that the black hole that the Rosin created began destroying the Earth's atmosphere, creating a gravitational pull that tore apart man's upper levels of matter, in other words, the great skyscrapers and even mountains that appeared to be plucked from their veins like fruit. Reports further indicate that the matter that makes up the human body also began to eradicate Slowly but surely, human forms were ripped from existence, I suppose much as Eric had lost his body on board the Rosin. But according to computer files, bodies had not just been ripped from existence, but from their very souls. People had physically died, but spiritually it seemed many were still there, trapped in a two-dimensional shadowy existence, a hell that no one had ever dreamed of. As Nikki's words enter his ears, David instantly begins thinking of his wife and daughter. But as they sit there contemplating all that they have done, there is suddenly a bright light that appears from overhead. Each member of the crew looks toward it, batting their eyes, trying to allow their vision to adjust so that they can see what it is. Then they hear the familiar voice of Director Fleming. Well, boys and girls, your mission simulation is complete. So I hope that you learned something useful, because the real mission starts first thing in the morning. As Commander David Hilker, Astronaut Pilot Jason Fry, Mission Specialists Eric Daniel and Nikki Jenkins, along with Payload Specialists Dr. Andrea Savoy, Dr. Navin Patel, Alex Gray, Jaleel Anders, and Dr. Shannon Riker, step from what they now know was just a massive simulator. They all know that there's no way that they can allow the mission that they trained for to ever happen. <laughs>